So coming out of the end of the 19th century, though, then the Ibsens and the Chekhovs were changing the yeah. uh, writing style. Yeah, the whole, whole new style, a whole new focus. And uh, we, uh, we got rid of the uh, superheroes. We got rid of the uh, aristocracy and the, the, the kings and queens and all of the, uh, the hierarchies. And we were looking more and more into the lives of increasingly ordinary people and increasingly lower lower class people. And so those people behave and think and feel and have completely different sensibilities. And then the acting style seeks to reproduce those new sets of, of uh, emotions. And was that a democratization of theater that I want to see the story of the porter and the maid as well as the prince? Yes. And the I think, I think most audiences want to see themselves reflected on the stage. And the nature of the audiences begins to change as the economies improve and more and more people have leisure and money to go to the theater. They want to see themselves on the stage. They want to see their own uh, milieu, their own stories on the stage. And up to that point, if we're talking 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, the popular entertainments were in the variety and music hall Absolutely, versions yes. yeah. and sort of village and town things. Yeah. And then there was the theater, and you're talking about the two yeah. the two enterprises coming together. Yeah. But the appeal of the old uh, epic rhetorical acting was so strong for so long that when classical tragedy actually broke down that's in the 18th century uh, and, and became less and less about remote, f fabulous, <coughs> mythical creatures, and more and more about flesh and blood people. The form of tragedy had to change. And equally, the form of, of uh, comedy became much more flexible. It wasn't any longer the, the uh, hard, diamond heart comedy of manners. It was about people who had sentiment. This is what the 18th century brings into the classical plays. Sentimentality, the good heart becomes the new value. You and so tragedy loses its starkness, comedy loses its hardness, and the two begin to meld into something quite new, which ultimately becomes drama and melodrama. Because I, uh, I do want to talk about, we talk about rhetorical acting, and if I'm looking at 1870 and 1880, what's the difference between melodrama and rhetorical acting? What's the difference between that and elevation? Oh, uh, the melodrama had a full range of rhetorical gestures and it was elevated. And that new audience loved to see that. They loved to see themselves on that scale. But was that degraded rhetorical acting then? Is melodrama a degraded version of rhetorical acting? I don't think so. I think melodrama is a perfectly valid art form in itself. It is one of the most thrilling forms of theater. And it is the opposite side of the coin from farce. And they're, they're both very demanding styles, very serious styles. Can you define melodrama then for me? Yeah, I think so. It is a simplification of the issues and the values. Uh, the, the good are immaculate, the evil are uh, damnable, and the suffering is brought about by circumstance rather than by individual failing. The heroine is being persecuted, not because of anything wrong that she has done, but because she is the victim of an evil person's desires. And so she is a victim of circumstance and must be saved by a change in circumstance. It's, much, it's, it's very clean. The issues 
are clean, the passions are clean. They're all very, very distinct. And they need grand uh, um, exposition of that on the stage. And now, it's is very, soap opera very, today hmm? melod a version of melodrama? Uh, every every, every um, um, Western you ever saw is a melodrama. Right. All, all the good people are very good, the bad people Absolutely. are bad. We know the ending will be like this. Bad we know day, it will be yeah. a white horse. Yes, we know yes. it will be... Absolutely. And that is a dream of ordinary people. If life could be like that, 